Hi, this is Paul. I want to do a little work on some of John Verveke's stuff today. I found a video which I, which again is well, John's conversation with um, with Lex Friedman. I haven't Friedman. I haven't had a chance to really go through or do a comment around, even though I thought that was a terrific conversation. I thought that was a. If you don't have fifty hours to watch Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. It's really helpful to look for one or two hour videos that can sort of give you an introduction into John's work. There's a video, um, Institute H21. It's a small channel, less than a thousand subs. The title of the visual video is John Verveke, Democracy and Relevance Realization of Distributed Cognition, September 24, 2022. I, I thought that was an excellent video. Now, part of what's difficult about recommending videos is that because I'm watching all of these um, perspectively for me, it could be that I think his presentation is getting better just because I'm able to understand it, or it could be because he has more experience presenting to larger audiences, and so his presentation is getting better. But I think his presentation is getting better. There are more illustrations in this video. It's more accessible, and it's really interesting how it's tied to democracy and I want to get there because that ties into a whole bunch of other themes that I'm working together. But I, before I do that, I want I do want to go to After Socrates, Episode 3. Uh, this is my, it's only the third one out, but this is my favorite episode so far. I hear from many of you that you struggle with John's work. You struggle with understanding what's going on. After Socrates, I think, is... So there was Buddhism and Cognitive Science. That was an early recording that was out on the internet. It was my first introductory to John, introduction to John's work. Then he had 50 episodes of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, which is out there on YouTube. And I think after Socrates will be even more user accessible or viewer accessible. Let's, let's talk about that because he slowed things down. Now I'm going to play this at 1.25 speed. Um, 1.25 doesn't distort too much. I've heard comments from some of you that, you know, you don't like it when we sort of speed up. I get a little impatient. I've listened to it once. I'm going to listen to it at least again, because if you, if you really want to get a sense of what John is doing with a lot of his project, this, this particular video has some real foundations in terms of why his, his work is important and what he's trying to build. And so I'm not going to play, it's an hour and 30 minutes, I'm not going to play the whole thing, but I am going to start at about minute 23. But again, this is my favorite of the After Socrates series so far. And and, and he's going to go through the, the four Ps of knowing, and I think, now I'm going to have some comment about why the propositional is so preeminent in modernity and in our world and I think part of it is because of our tools. Written language can communicate the propositional very well. Video can communicate the propositional very well. Video can also communicate the perspectival. I think part of the reason narrative is so powerful is because narrative probably does a better job at communicating all four Ps via written text and via verbal text than most of the other tools that we have. So I want to play a little bit of this video and then I want to talk about Christian deconstruction and why some of this is happening because it's directly related to this. So let's, uh, let's jump into this. That's the space of perspectival knowing. That's what gives me my sense of situated awareness. So what's your perspectival knowing? What's it like to be me here now in this state of mind correlated with this situation? So for example, I'm sober, I'm in the studio, and I'm doing this particular thing. So now, now, what he did just there is deeply connected to phenomenology, which has been a word that you'll hear a lot from Jonathan Peugeot. It's underneath a lot of Jordan Peterson's work. It's underneath a lot of John Verveke's work, Heidegger, Husserl, these philosophers that looked at phenomenology. So much of 
what, what he just did right there is much more of, let's say, let's use another common term that's getting thrown around right now, lived experience. Just, just sort of what it's like to be me, what it's like to be here, what I'm feeling, what I'm seeing, what I'm doing. It's kind of a, a global picture. And the propositional, which is sort of a pointing theory of knowledge. Now, that, that pointing theory of knowledge is also con connected to, obviously, the pointing theory of truth. And that'll be important. We'll see where this video goes, how much time I have this afternoon to make it. But the four Ps are a way of trying to bring into, into an arena which is propositionally biased some of the other three Ps. Now you might say, well, what about those other three Ps? You're living in those other three Ps all the time. Well, what are the three Ps? Well, he's going to walk through them. And, and I think he's going to, he walks through them in a very good way that hopefully will be more and more accessible to people. And, and key to this, as any pastor knows, is good illustrations. And he's got some good illustrations. A lot of skills are not being activated or coordinated right now. I am not activating my swimming skill, at least as far as I can tell, nor am I activating my skill of how to kiss somebody I love. That would be creepy and weird. What tells me which skills to bring online, how to properly coordinate them, and which ones I might need to acquire? Well, this is your perspectival knowing. What it's like to be you here now, in this state of mind, in this situation. It's your salience landscaping. Salience is what stands out to you, what grabs your attention, what arouses your metabolism, what... Now, <clears throat> part of, I, I really like these little pullouts. They go by fast. And so if you're watching this and kind of working through it, now, part of the participatory arena of video listening, I listened to a lot of this video when I was driving in my car okay so i didn't see the little pullouts now this is an aspect of youtube that that listen that youtube creators have to sort of keep in mind but you you don't want to sort of hobble videos by just assuming they're audio only and so the salience landscape a little little slide comes out the way a cognitive agent determines relevance through decisions about how to commit its attentional metal, <laughs> metabolic, temporal, and behavioral resources in a highly complex, dynamic, and self-organizing manner. That's a mouthful. Um, to put it in, say, Jordan Peterson terms in his conversation with John Verveke, your salience is what shines. So the burning bush sort of grabs Moses' salience, um, salience landscape, not just because there's smoke and fire in the wilderness, but because he's seen many brush fires, and if you've ever watched a brush fire in the wilderness, they kind of flash through and they're gone because the, the bushes are very light, they're very quickly consumed, and they kind of whoosh through. You see this in California quite a bit. But the, book, the bush kept burning. And he could have walked by once and the bush is burning, he walks by again. That bush should have been burned out long ago. Why isn't the bush burning? Take off your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. What? What? So salience length, that which draws your attention, that's which, and we experience it like, this is where you get into John's transjective idea. We experiencing it in, in just the language you use, draws our attention. It, it, it sort of, the bush sort of reaches out and grabs us. And that's, that's the language we use. This grabbed it. And as I'm teaching, say, what, what, um, what did you see when you read this or what grabbed your attention? Triggers your affect. And what's salient is constantly shifting around. It's a dynamic topography. It's your salient. And, and that triggers your affect. Your affect are your emotions. What, what, what grabs you emotionally? It's landscaping. Now, so I have a, a state of mind. I'm sober. And I have a sense of here nowness and how everything is together in my awareness. And this is a, and that glues on to a particular situation. That's the other pole. 
and then between them, the salience landscaping is taking place, and that is actually what we mean by a perspective. What it, what's it like to be here now looking this way, this salience landscape, and so I see this part of the world as a particular situation for me. So this is knowing what it's like to be in your state of mind, in this situation, doing this salience landscaping. So this is very global. This is very experiential. This is, this is, this is what it feels like. And, and we struggle to have words because this, we're so completely emerged, immersed in this, um, in this, in this way of being. It has a different kind of memory associated with it. It's episodic memory. So compare this to, when did you, you know, learn that 2 plus 2 equals 4? Well, I don't know. I'm probably in grade school. But you're inferring. You're not remembering. Compare that to episodic memory. What, do you, what was the most interesting thing you did last night? Oh, well, I did. Again, again, pay attention. The it's it's via these illustrations. So when I, I love that illustration. When did you first learn two plus two equals four? I have no idea. Tell me about your first kiss. <laughs> Salience landscape. First kiss. That I mean, I and I, I don't mean. Yeah. Tell me the first time you kissed your mother. I don't remember that at all. <laughs> or the first time my mother kissed me. I don't. That was before I started constructing this autobiography that I sort of call myself. But uh, first, um, first romantic kiss as at least a, um, a sexually mature being. Yeah, I, I, I remember that. Do this and this and this, and then what do you do? What do you? What do you? What's an episode? Well, it's a chunk of memory around perspectival knowing. An episode is your particular. What was you, it, when you re go back into the episode? Oh, that was my state of mind. That was the situation, and this is what I was finding salient in it. The first time I met the woman who would become my wife. The first time I saw her. I remember the first time I saw her. I remember the first time I spoke with her. I remember the first time I kissed her. I mean, all of those things, those are memories that are, I can pull them up right away. Two plus two equals four, gone. First time, you know, ever get a kiss kiss from my mother on the cheek, gone. You know, that, that happened all the time. No episodic memory, so episodic memory. Yeah, that's what episodic memory is. And again, it's different from semantic memory. It's different from procedural memory. And notice it has a different sense of realness to it. It isn't. Now, now semantic memory, I remember that uh, the sky is blue. I remember that uh, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Um, procedural memory, uh, you talked about this already. How do, um, how do you change the... Um, how do you change a tire on a car? That's procedural memory. You do this, you do this, you do this, you just, how do you bake something in the kitchen? You do this, you do this, it's just, uh, procedural memory. How do you ride a bike? It'd be very difficult to, to communicate to someone how to ride a bike by giving them a string of text. And what you would do with all of that text is you would probably use as much imagistic words as possible. You'd use metaphors and and like this, like this. You'd compare it to other procedural things. But, you know, it's the only way to learn how to swim is I'm I, I almost done with 1883. Wow, what a series. Um, I haven't watched any of the other Yellowstone things, but 1883, quite, quite moving and quite, quite powerful. But, you know, that you had all these German immigrants and none of them know how to swim because they said they weren't allowed to swim. It's like, wow, pretty rough in Germany for these poor peasants. But they, they didn't know how to swim. Well, you have to teach someone to swim in water. And my, my children, almost all, were lifeguards in the local city pools. And a big part of their job was teaching swimming. You teach people to swim in water. Because you can describe, you can tell people a bunch of things, but you got to get in the water if you're going to learn how to swim. So much power or 
truth in the sense of conviction, being convinced that a belief is true. It's that very word that I mentioned a few minutes ago. It's a sense of presence, being here now in the situation. Dan Chiappi and I have published three papers about the scientists using the rovers on Mars, and, they're and they look for people who can get that sense. Somehow people who can look at still black and white photographs that have come from the rovers on Mars, time delayed, and yet they can look at these photographs and get a sense of being on Mars. And that, that's his go-to illustration. It's a really good one. I, I think about when the first time we bought a PS3 for, um, the only one time we bought a PS3, bought a, bought a game console for Christmas for my kids. And my kids had been playing game consoles in other people's houses, and they just picked up those joysticks and off they went. And I thought, well, I've played computer games. They destroyed me. They destroyed me, and and you know they would you know they would destroy me and enjoy destroying me because. But but that's all you know. It's all immersed in that world, and I couldn't, I I couldn't you know at my ripe old age in the in my forties I couldn't manipulate those little that little game controller in a way that would manipulate the character or the or the ship or whatever we were playing on the screen very well. They 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 could do it. Why? Well, I they had the hours. They learned it when they were young. They had. I mean, I learned it when I was old and haven't had anywhere near as many hours doing it because I've got responsibilities and such. They have a sense of presence, of really being there, and it turns out that that's actually central to them being able to do the work. Another way of looking at this is all the work being done on the psychology of virtual games. What makes a game real to people, a virtual game, isn't necessarily very similitude, how realistic it looks. It's instead... Oh, it's good. Very similitude. Um, and this, again, is sort of this one-to-one -one correspondence. Are all, the, are all the pixels right in the person's face? No, actually, you can get immersed. Rick's been playing his Commodore uh, 64 or 128 games lately. And, and you look at those computer games from the... Gosh, they would be what from the '80s, and they 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 look, you know, crude compared to consoles today. But you can still be immersed in it. I remember the first computer game I played in college. There was a mainframe, and there was a little Star Trek game, and basically the the college had to crack down on that because kids were eating all up all kinds of mainframe bandwidth playing that Star Trek game, and. It was just a little character-based game on a black and white, um, a black and white monitor that had characters in it. But we were immersed. It was very low resolution. We were immersed in that game. The ability to create this sense of presence. People can get that sense of presence with games that aren't realistic. They can get it with Tetris, for example. They feel like they're in Tetris, and they'll even start to have episodic memories and dream in the Tetris world. So notice this has a very different memory, different sense of realness to it. You may think, well, that's the bottom level, right? That's, so I get it, right? Propositions have to do with our sort of reasoning capacity and procedural is maybe sort of our basic skills and cognition and perspectival is about consciousness and the, how it gives us, affords a particular way of knowing. That's it, right? No, it's not it. There's a fourth way. Now, let me say something about this before I explain what it is, because it's actually central. And this is a big sort of move that has come through philosophy, especially epistemology, over the last 40 years or so. I'm going to say this carefully, because <laughs> it can be really confusing. You don't have to know that you know in order to know. What? <laughs> okay. So there are many things you know, and you might not know that you know them. You not, might not be able to justify that you know them. OK, that sort of makes sense. Well, what's the problem? Why, why, are, why are philosophers so concerned about that? Because if, or, if in order to know x, 
I have to know that I know X. Then how do I know that I know this? Well, I, in order to know this, I have to know that I know it. But then I have to know, oh, right. This is going to get me into an infinite regress. So this is where we really get into, we, we, can, we can sort of sense propositional knowing when we're doing it, we can be, and procedural and perspectival. But this fourth kind, participatory knowing, is at this deeper level. OK, well, what do you mean by participatory knowing? Well, first of all, notice that you actually shift between perspectives. Oh, yeah. I do that all the time. Where are you doing that? Well, I'm doing it in my mind. That's 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 just say it's a kind. That's just to say it's a kind of knowing. Where are you doing that? Oh, that's a really good question. What is it that's affording and constraining? Which perspectives you take up? How do those perspectives emerge? What do they emerge from? Right, good question. OK. So here's what participatory knowledge, participatory knowing is. I have me. I'll just use me as an example. But you can put you there if you wish. Right? And I'm an agent. What does, it, what does that mean? Well, what agency is a big topic. So I'm not going to give a full definition. I'm going to give something that I think is central to what an agent is. An agent is able to determine the consequences of its behavior and alter its behavior in order to change the consequences and bring about consequences that it wants. OK? Now, I'm just going to read this little bubble. Participatory knowing, finding agency within an agent arena relationship by, by being fitted to the arena. The arena is able to determine the consequences of behavior and alter that behavior to bring about the desired consequences. Now, desire is an important piece in this. So there's telos, there's goal and destination. That's all an important piece in this. Okay, so what? That means... There's a relationship between your agency and whether or not the world will accommodate and support that agency. So let's do something that's a very sort of simple example. I take up the agentic role of being a tennis player, and I run into a football stadium wanting to play tennis. It's not going to work. I'm literally in the wrong arena. So there's a co-identification. You can only be an agent in a particular arena, and you can only be a particular arena for action if there are particular agents available. And this doesn't have to do just with humans. This has to do with, in bi biology, what's called niche construction. Organisms are shaped through evolution to fit an environment, but organisms, through their actions, <clears throat> shape and change the environment. So there's a loop. There's an agent arena relationship niche construction. And we're doing it all the time. In fact, I want you to notice that all the time, right now, you are assuming an identity for yourself. I'm a student. I'm a philosopher. I'm a psychologist. I'm somebody wanting to be more Socratic. And you're assigning an arena. The place that you're in is a place that suits those kinds of actions that come out of that kind of agency. And probably people are watching this thinking, I'm a, I'm a father, I'm a, a spiritual person, I'm a, a man, I'm a woman, and I would like to what? And, and what's really interesting is that there's a lot of dead reckoning because we don't exactly know what we want. We, we noted that you know, to be an agent is to, is to engage productively, cooperatively with the arena in order to achieve a desired outcome. But in many cases, especially in questions of, I'm just going to use this language, spiritual transformation, we're not exactly sure what the destination should be. There's a ton of dead reckoning in there. Now, I was just talking to Chad and Hezi 
on uh, the just chatting. And, you know, someone goes into a recovery program because um, they're drinking too much and it's destroying their life. And something has, the, some bottom has fallen out someplace or they've had a, some, somebody has confronted them or they just, at this point, they just want to get sober and they're, they're sick of, they're sick of not being sober and they, they just want to go there. So that sobriety might be a destination, but I was talking to Chad about, Chad talked about the fact that you have some people that go to AA and they think the point of AA is, the point of AA is to just stop drinking. When in fact, the point of AA is a major transformation in life, which would um, not only keep you from drinking, but afford a transformation that makes you a much better person. And I, I can see this analogy to Christianity. Some people might go to church because they want to stop certain sins in their life, where the goal is to become a very different person, to have a very different agent arena relationship in a far larger frame. And they want to have a productive, cooperative relationship with the arena in order to become something that they're not quite sure what it is. Now, in after Socrates, it might be perhaps you read Socrates or even you just heard his name and maybe you read a dialogue or he's famous for some reason. You think, I'd, I'd rather be more like Socrates than less like Socrates because Socrates seemed smart. He seemed to know. He seemed to have a handle on things. And so that's where these ideals sort of happen. Uh, in Christianity, obviously, I'd like to be more like Jesus. Okay, well, what about Jesus? And you get into questions of, oh, okay, what specific aspects, specific behaviors? And that's where propositional, procedural, and perspectival and participatory really sort of come into play. Because if you look at certain traditions, let's say the Anabaptist tradition, they tended to be quite procedural. Well, you read the New Testament, you you find Jesus says do this, so I do that. Okay. Um, propositional, Jesus is the Son of God, and so if I say Jesus is the Son of God, then, well, you, you say that and you profess that propositional knowledge in the hopes of perhaps engaging productively and cooperatively with the arena that is God. I have talked about often God number one and God number two as God number one as the arena and God number two as the agent. Um, agent and arena, and then people sometimes say, well, God the Father's number one, God number two, son. No, not at all. That's not at all. Once you say God the Father, he's very agentic. Um, and Jesus, once you say you're in Christ, it's very arenic. So there's a, there's a lot going on in there. But but we, we have a sense that we want to go and become something even if we're tremendously unclear on exactly what that can be. And we get inklings of it probably much more in terms of participation, inklings of it, maybe not procedure. Procedure and propositional are, are fairly, um, you'll get into that, what's the best word for that? Propositional and procedural are fairly thin compared to perspectival, which is thicker still, and then participatory, which is kind of the richest of the ways. Now, we've been talking about these four Ps for a long time in this little corner of the internet, and if you bump around enough among certain characters, you will find some people with ideas for amending and changing or improving the four Ps. And I think that's um, a fine thing because that's a, that's a question of fine tuning and improving the model, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all good. And you can go and find those individuals. I'm not going to name them right now. They have their own YouTube channels and um, they're, they're wonderful participants in this little corner of the arena. But for the sake of introduction and simplicity, we're going to use John's four Ps as canonical. Okay. I just added another word there. Oh, we've already got a canon. Canons emerge. So I'm going to be using John's four Ps as canonical just because that will serve the broadest audience possible. <clears throat> so there's an agent arena co-identification process. 
But the way to understand it is that both the agent and the arena are participating in forces, I'm trying to use a neutral term here, in factors that shape them to fit each other. And you go, well, what are you talking about? I can walk around. I can walk around. Gravity has shaped this and shaped me so I can walk around. Oh. Biology has shaped me through evolution and also had me, well, human beings and their ancestors shape the environment to fit bipedalism. Bipedalism is one of our huge evolutionary advantages. That's also how I can walk around. But culture has shaped me and this environment. There are floors here, flat floors. I have shoes on. I've been taught how to walk around in particular environments. For example, in this environment, there's tape on the floor telling me, John, you have to sort of stand here because we're doing this cultural thing of making a video, et cetera, et cetera. So the environment has been shaped, tape on the floor. I shape myself to fit it. So the physics shaping us so walking is possible. The biology shaping the agent in the arena so walking is possible. Culture shaping me and the arena so walking is possible. And then my ongoing cognition, right? is capable of finding what's relevant in the environment for moving around and seeing those aspects. Oh, that's a flat place through which I can walk. And shaping me to it. This is how I should walk. Oh, but there's an, there's an object, so I have to move around it. So the environment is shaping my sensory motor pathway. And my sensory motor loop is also shaping the environment because I'm moving around and I can move objects in that environment. <clears throat> All of these co-shapings, co-identifications, are creating affordances. This is a term from Gibson, central term in 4E cognitive science. An affordance is a real existing possibility for action. This floor affords walking. Is the walking in the floor? Blue whale can't walk on it. Oh. Is the walking in me? I can't walk in space. Nothing's happening. The walking isn't in the floor. It's not in me. It is a real agent arena relationship resulting from co-shaping that is, right, is there. It's not in me, it's not in the environment. It is between us. And remember how Socrates is metaxu, between, that, trans that transjectivity. Now, I, I want to use an example here, say from the New Testament with Jesus. Why did Jesus get attention? Jesus engage, why, why, why do miracles grab our attention? Because miracles raise questions about affordances. And when Jesus would do a miracle, suddenly people get an idea about the affordance of the arena and the relationship between Jesus and the arena. So much of the motivation for people pursuing religious transformation is about affordances. Let's say, and, and this isn't just miracles or religious things, let's say you move into a house and you discover there's a piano in the house. Um, there's a, there's a lot that's going to go into the affordance of 
you participating in the creation of beautiful music in that space. In other words, affordance is something that happens between. I, I've, I've said for a long time, um, part of the language of the New Testament is the Holy Spirit is within me. I think a careful reading of the New Testament shows that the Holy Spirit is between us. Because what the Holy Spirit enables is an affordance between people. That's koinonia. So, I mean, and I, I use these two examples for you because I know for some people, because John isn't a Christian, although I think he's very Christian friendly, and the conversation about Neoplatonism seems terribly philosophical. Getting a degree of language about this very deep level, and we're going to get to it pretty quickly now, this very deep level, we'll get into why both people are attracted to religions and why they feel themselves dropping out of them in the world. So... What's the kind of memory that goes with that agent arena relationship? All the roles and all the identities. This is the weird kind of memory you call yourself. That's what yourself is. Yourself is this set, and we're going to talk a lot more about this, the set of roles. Now, notice what he called the self. He said it's a weird, weird kind of memory. And that's important because most of us don't, think about ourselves in terms like a memory. We think about semantic memory. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. You know, semantic is, is very related to propositional, that. Okay. We might think about episodic memory. I know that two plus two equals four. That's semantic. I don't have any episodic memory about learning it, but I do remember first kiss. That's an episode. Um, you probably, if it's not too traumatic, you probably remember both very good and very bad experiences in your life, and you remember them episodically. Now, again, we know that memory is not simply something as low resolution as a video recorder, because we might think, oh, a video recorder is very accurate, and you can record it in 4K. Now, the reason I say that it's low resolution is it's just recording an image of physical relationships. And when you remember either a very good or a very bad experience or a very important experience, you remember it actually higher resolution. You might be a little, you, you lose perhaps some physicalist detail, but you remember some other procedural elements you, you probably lose some propositional elements. You remember some procedural elements. You remember some perspectival elements. And you really remember participatorial elements. Now, when he calls the self a memory, and so those of you who have been listening to this for a while can remember a conversation, one of my first conversations with John that I had when we were talking about the self, and we talk about the self as sort of an autobiographical narrative. And, and in many ways, this is... This, this, in our culture, is very much like the self, okay? And that's, that's deeply tied. It, it doesn't exhaust it, but it's deeply tied to it. And so that's why he says it's a memory. And I didn't want you to miss that because it's, it's actually pretty important here. And I did. Actually, I want to play a little something. On my video today about the Canadian... College of Psychology, someone pointed me to this video, and what a gold mine. 11 years ago, this is sort of canonical Jordan Peterson, low resolution video, sound is passable, but um, this is sort of, this is Jordan Peterson when he's still a clinician and his stories and his examples and his illustrations are fresh. This really nicely lays out the self as memory. 
I have this client, she said she had this experience a week ago that was, she knows a fair bit about theology because she was a religious student at McGill. And she compared what happened to her to Paul being struck dead, um, the story of Paul being struck dead by a vision in, in, the, in Acts. Now, this is what happened to her. I'm not struck dead, um, struck down. She has one of these families that's so bloody pathological that it's, it's, it's nightmarish. And it's partly because of social influences, because in her particular culture, the rule for women is shut up and be useless. And th that's not a very good rule if you want people to develop healthily, although it's a very, very common rule in many cultures. And so that's one of the cultural rules. And then the rule in her family at the moment, because she's tangled up with her mother and her sister, is something like... Um, Nothing that happens to you can be furthered by your own efforts. You have to rely on God, and he'll deliver no matter what. And so that means that if you ever try to do something, you're just being foolish. And if you ever do something, we should punish you half to death because you're trying to disprove our existential theory. And so this poor girl has been punished nonstop since she was born, every time she did something that was useful. It's just unbelievable. And... Doing something in this household is so difficult that it's a miracle. You, you just couldn't imagine it. Um, so anyways, we've been trying to get to the bottom of this bloody, horrible mess for, for years, really. And she's never been able to stand up to her mother or her sister. But she finally did two weeks ago and told them that they had been involved in this collusion that was designed to make her the source of all pathology in the whole family, and that that had been going on for about 40 years. And uh, so that was quite the meeting, as you might imagine. It was a little on the harsh side. And I felt pretty good after that, um, surprisingly enough, even though it was so awful. But she's uh, having a rough time, eh, because she finally used the word abuse. Right, so there's all this cloud of things that happened to her that, oof, this is not so good. So she had this dream. I'll tell you about this dream. So she dreamt that she was out in a field with her sister. And this invisible boy who was like a ghost. Her mother wanted a boy, not her. So she's out in this sort of pasture-like field with her sister and uh, this boy. And two holes opened up in the landscape. And the older daughter got to pick the first hole. You look through the hole, there was a, like a landscape that was even more beautiful. It was like a paradise. She got to put her arm in that hole. And then another hole opened up, and there was a pretty good landscape in there too. So uh, the invisible ghost boy got to put his arm in that one. And then the third hole opened up, and behind that there was like a hellish landscape. And she got to put her whole arm in that one. And that's right. That's exactly right. That's what happened to her whole life. Eh? Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because... She has her mother and her sister, and she loves them, right? Because they're her mother and her sister, and they're kind of all she's got. And so, but then she hasn't had a very good time with them. And so it's not so easy to decide that someone that you love and need has also more or less consciously ground you up for 40 years, right? You can see how that might produce a bit of stress, that realization. And so she finally put the word to it. She said it was like the... Uh, UN deciding what happened in Rwanda was genocide. It wasn't genocide till they said it was genocide. It was just a bunch of people killing each other. As soon as you name it, well, then the whole situation changes. So she named it, and then she said, well, now what do I do? I have to redo all my memories. Right? Because yesterday I didn't have the memories of someone who was abused. And now I have the memories of someone that was abused. So I have to fix all those memories and reinterpret them. Because she thought she was just crazy. I kept talking to her, and I thought, this girl is not as crazy as people think. She's of someone who was abused, and now I have the memories of someone that was abused, so I have to fix all those memories and reinterpret them, because she thought she was just crazy. I kept talking to her, and I thought, this girl is not as crazy as people think. I mean, she was a real pain in the neck because she behaved so... This talk is really weird because he has almost verbatim repetitions in this talk at a few different places. It's very strange, but I'm distracted from the main point badly and it's no wonder but fundamentally she wasn't that crazy and the more I got to know her the more I thought man if I was here I'd be crazy too so so and then she had to reconceptualize herself in the present because instead of thinking that she's been mentally ill since she was 10 
she started to have to think that, well, no, not. She was more like the victim of this sort of evil conspiracy. And then she has to reconceptualize her future. And so she's just, I don't know if she can handle it. And that's this background, this background chaos. So, in other words, herself. Her, and you can see the memory aspect of the self. And you can see the whole, you know, this isn't just propositional, you're crazy. The propositional is important. You're, you've been abused. Boom, that word, like Rwanda. Suddenly, that word, the propositional level, it changes. But that's not just propositional. It's, I know somebody want to say that it's parabolic. Um, it's procedural. Well, she's going to have to figure out how to relate to her mother and her sister. It's perspectival. Boy, abuse. That's just this walloping perspectival transformation that happens. No, I'm crazy. No, you're not. You're a victim of these people. I'm a victim of my mother and my sister who love me. Well, don't they love me? Yeah, they do love you. They're just not very good procedurally at loving at all. And now in terms of parts, parts, participation, now she's got to redo her whole life because of this and herself. She's, what, what is she doing? What is she doing with Jordan as her clinician? She is reworking her whole life. Well, why? Because in the midst of that abuse and that melee, um, perspectively, there are huge problems. Um, in procedurally, there are huge problems. She probably was having pro terrible problems with her relationship. She couldn't relate to other people. Um, now, in terms of propositional knowledge, she might have not had a, a terribly bad package in terms of all kinds of things that were and weren't true necessarily. But you can see how the self, in that sense, is, is sort of a memory. That's what your self is. Your self is this set, and we're going to talk a lot more about this, the set of roles and identities that you've stored How do you know that yourself is real? By participating in yourself, by being yourself. Now, there's a lot there, and it's tricky because, you know, I should probably do a word that fudges in terms of real, because in many ways, what the recession of modernity and What's happening in our world right now is a massive, it's always, it's always this way, but it's a massive struggle over what is real, what is most real, what do we mean by that? Modernity has programmed many people in the West who believe that, that what is most real is primarily physical, and truth that is most true is primarily referential to the physical. And why these four Ps are so powerful is now suddenly, instead of having this flat earth where everything is propositional and physical and referential, what we're pointing to. Now, again, we're not getting rid of that. And in fact, the struggle that we have in terms of talking about this is that we're using words and words are very powerful in that way. The car is in the parking lot. That's very powerful. Now, when John Verveke calls the car the North American death machine, well, we're using words, but we're using words in a different way. So a lot of what's happening now is we're, we're being able to get beyond the certain way we used words that gave us a tremendous amount of procedural knowledge and propositional knowledge, but was weaker on perspectival knowledge and insufficient. Well, it gave us a, a degree of participatory power in this world. I mean, all that techne, but insufficient, but we, we've realized its limitations. We can split the atom. Does that mean we will always split it wisely? 
we can split it for power, but does that mean, well, what, what is the goal? What is the telos? What is the end? What is the purpose of that power? What's it like when participatory knowing isn't working? Well, what you'll find up is what you'll find is the affordance landscape dries up. Okay, this part right here. When you look at why people are walking away from the church, walking away from religion, walking away, this is this this is why people walk away. The affordance landscape dries up. What's it like when participatory knowing isn't working? Well, what you'll find up is what you'll find is the affordance landscape dries up. Well, when does that happen? Culture shock. Go to another culture. <laughs> oh, oh, it's shocking. That's what anthropology relies on. Homesickness. I'm in this wonderful hotel room in Austin, Texas. I'm stranded there by Air Canada. And I don't want to be there. I want to be home. I can't be myself. And home is a place where the agent arena relationship is really working. Jesus can't do miracles in this town that he can do in that town. Even Jesus, because of the faith, there's a ton in this right here. And when let's say we'll use we'll use recovery when someone undergoes a transformation the kind of transformation that let's say a recovery program puts you into suddenly you have all these new affordances and and that's you know power has become a dirty word but it ought not to be a dirty word because power is something that in fact we have been given by god and we are to use. And when in the book of Genesis, um, the Lord says to Adam and Eve that they, the man and the woman, that they will have dominion, they're basically saying, you will have affordance over this creation. That's basically what they're saying. And so when, when people have the bottom drop out on their worldview, and they switch it for another, they're usually looking for affordance. And again, it's a, it's a transformation of the agent arena relationship, and it's a turn in the memory of the self, and it's not unlike that illustration of the woman who now, there's a perspectival realization of abuse. Jordan, through two years of counseling, helped her, because before, all the procedural Knowledge within that family was sort of a self-contained unit. Well, when someone does this, this is what we say. When someone does that, this is what we say. And, you know, it was all bound up with religious stuff. And what happened was there was a switch in the transformation in order for her, well, she's going to have to re, she's going to have to go through that stack. Now look at, again, look at a recovery program. One of the steps in a recovery program is that you go through and you make amends. Well, what is that doing? That means you're going through yourself, which is that memory stack of all this episodic, all of these things, and you start to, whether or not people can, and and you know, AA is very wise about this, if, if making amends would harm them, you don't do it. Because then there are situations like that. The world is enormously complex. But you work through this in order to redo the self so that you now are, now we can use more verbaki words, if addiction is reciprocal narrowing, you've got, you have very little affordance because the alcohol has become all that you think about. The other way is reciprocal broadening. Now suddenly, you have way more affordance in the agent arena relationship. You as the agent can do, you're much more powerful. 
Now you might say, well, well, maybe you're not as powerful as you were when you were 21 and a young, fit person. No, but you're way more powerful in terms of relationships because probably when you were 21, you couldn't do all sorts of things that you can do now because you didn't have wisdom. And I probably shouldn't prolong this and bring in the other video, but this point right here is so critical and and it helps give us some language about transformation and a vision for transformation and an idea why let's say let's tell a little story let's imagine that um you know when you turned 18 or 21 you went into the military and maybe you drove a tank or operated a missile battery or or walked around with a with an assault rifle and and you thought maybe you were powerful but you realized that no you weren't powerful at all and then you went you got out of the you got out of the military and then you had to sort of piece together your life and and it could be that even as as an old man you're far more powerful than you were as a young man running around with a gun why well i'll tell you it's the old men that uh, that send the young men in their tanks and missile batteries and guns out into the field to do things in the world so which is more powerful the guy who's holding the gun or the guy who's directing thousands of people with guns to go and do something it's affordance in an agent arena relationship. So if you're if you haven't if you if you struggle with John's project in terms of understanding, I think after Socrates is going to be a big step up into trying to get a sense of what's he doing? What's he saying? Now again, it's not a small commitment, but I'm hoping that, you know, like with many of my commentary videos, I'm hoping that this can sort of flesh things out and and you can begin to to have an understanding of well, all of these words, four ways of knowing, agent arena relationship. If I contextualize and understand these, how can these be helpful in terms of my own transformation? Because you want to be transformed into someone with more agency. You want to raise your the affordance in your relationship. You want to be able to do something. You want to be able to sit down at a plan at a piano and play beautiful music. You want to be able to go to a family gathering, and even though some people are drinking, you're not going to drink, and you're going to have a lovely time with people, and you're going to leave, and the whole family won't be embarrassed by the kinds of things that you used to do because you didn't have any power against alcohol, let's say. Or you walked into a family relationship and you said things that destroyed the family unit. Or you participated in certain things with the family that stressed and broke relationships so that people couldn't be in relationship through time in order to build things together. Or maybe you're married and maybe you grow an affordance that when you and the person that you're married to have a collision, you can figure out how to work through that collision. So once you begin to understand and have a little bit higher resolution on some of these things, you can say, wow, yeah, just having propositional knowledge or even procedural knowledge Perspectival knowledge is a bit larger, and then, of course, participatory knowledge, where, in a sense, all of these things are brought together. And, and again, I think part of the reason that narrative is so powerful is, in many ways, narrative is able to convey all four Ps of knowing in a verbal form, in a written form. Now, obviously, movies with pictures and images, and I mean, that's that's a highly powerful way of of giving us a lot and 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 sort of an immersed an immersion experience. And and when we talk about an immersion experience, that's that's perspectival. Um, it's it's definitely propositional, but 
it gets very rich. And then I think why the reason why people say, yeah, movies are cool, but a computer game is because it's participatory. So that's that'll give you kind of a, a richer sense of the four Ps and a sense of why this language can be helpful in can be helpful in becoming a better person. And for me, as a Christian, becoming a better Christian and having a better understanding of what it means to be in Christ. So that's there's Christ the arena, me as the Christian as the agent. Christ in the world. That's Christ as the agent and the world, a fallen, broken world, but Christ working in the arena. And, and then all the different ways of knowing and bringing them all together. So, yeah, this other video, I, I'll probably get to it at some point because it was it was it was an outstanding lecture I thought and there was a there was a ton in it but I get the sense that um, this was good for this so uh, please leave a comment and let me know what you think